Good evening, good afternoon, and good morning, everyone. We're pleased to welcome you back uh, to the Data Collection Webinar Series, uh, which is organized by the Data Collection Unit at UNICEF headquarters. We are pleased to resume uh, the series today after a few months break. Uh, I'm Attila Hanjolo. I'm the chief of the Data Collection Unit um, in UNICEF headquarters. Uh, I'm the global coordinator of the multiple indicator cluster surveys. Uh, we will be covering topics in the series that have recently gained relevance or importance and where there is ongoing work on how best to collect data on these topics. This winter spring series begins today uh, with the topic toxic lead and children's health approaches to blood lead testing. We have an exciting lineup of webinars actually uh, scheduled later uh, during the year over the few uh, next few months, which include uh, new tools for anemia testing, uh, collecting data on slum households, uh, degree of urbanization, vaccine hesitancy, and validation of mixed plus substitution methodology. Before we begin, some housekeeping rules. We have scheduled about an hour and 30 minutes today, including Q&A. As always, uh, throughout the webinar, please remain muted. Kindly write your questions in the chat box. We will try and group your questions and direct them to the presenters during the Q&A. The webinar is being recorded and will be available on our SharePoint site uh, together with the past webinars. We will also post recordings onto the Mix YouTube channel. And so these webinars are going to be publicly available. You can find the links to both of these in the email that you received. As I mentioned uh, earlier, today's webinar is entitled Toxic Lead and Children's Health approaches to blood lead testing and we are happy uh, to have with us five presenters uh, in order of presentation uh, we have abid solomon who is a senior program manager in the health section in the program group in unicef headquarters we have desire raquel narvaez who is an environmental health specialist uh, in, in, in program group in UNICEF headquarters as well. And we have three colleagues from UNICEF Georgia office. Uh, Tako Ugulava, who is a uh, health and nutrition specialist. Nino Tsotsanatsi, environmental health officer. And Georgi Kalakashvili, who is a child rights monitoring specialist at Georgia country office. Abit will start the presentation, providing us with an overview. Desire will follow uh, presenting strategies for measuring lead in children. And uh, colleagues from Georgia country office will then present the Georgia case study. So without further ado, Abit, the floor is yours. Let me start by saying some big statements, maybe to say the world is no longer the same. Um, and essentially to say that environmental risks have evolved. And decades ago, we could, we, we, we've been, for decades, we've been working on environmental risks. That's not new. We've worked in the area of water sanitation and hygiene. We've worked in the area of vector control. Uh, uh, issues uh, that are uh, somewhat poverty, uh, uh, that are poverty related, several in your face, you could see them. You could, uh, you know what we were talking about, but now we have certain issues like this issue of lead, which are the invisible risks that present, that come uh, to affect children's health. And by no means they are, uh, they are to be taken lightly as we will see during the presentation. And of course, we are gonna be talking more on the data side and how to assess and make those invisible risks visible. Uh, and so I'm really happy to be, in the company of data enthusiasts who are uh, keen to keen to uh, shed light on this very important issue. So let's move to the next slide. 
So since you're all data in, uh, enthusiasts and you'll have to do a couple of clicks for me and uh, maybe three clicks, if that's okay. So if, if, um, if you actually look at the, the burden of disease uh, in children, uh, um, zero to 19, um, and you break it down under the children that live in low-income country context, low-middle-income country context, upper-middle-income country context, and high-income context, you have a burden of disease, but if you look at the burden of disease and you start to say, well, that is essentially why children fall sick, but you got to go a step below to see, well, what are the risk factors that contribute to this? So in the sequence of issues that you have across different country contexts, the risks are classified in three categories. The orange uh, that you see, which are called metabolic risks, uh, the green that you see, which are environmental risks, and then there are behavioral risks. And we work on several of these across several countries. But I wanted to flag some of the environmental risks. So if you would click again, please, Archana. Uh, you look at the issue of air pollution and another two clicks, I think. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Good, that's fine. So thank you for that. So, so if you look at the issue of air pollution, that has really moved up. I mean, there are certain air pollution issues we should have been working some time ago. We haven't. Uh, haven't done the programming around that or uh, enough maybe data collection like the household air pollution from solid fuels. Um, uh, that that was always an issue, but now you have in several of the country contexts ambient air pollution also moving up, which is an important risk. And the second one you see a little lower down the order, and that's simply because we don't still understand the magnitude of it. Otherwise, we understand the magnitude of it. Sorry, we just don't know how big uh, uh, how deeply it's affected children, because there's a big challenge in terms of reliable data, which we will talk about, is the issue of lead exposure, which you see a little bit lower down the list. Uh, and then there are several several others. Uh, so so th this is the reality of environmental hazards. So we're going to talk more about the issue of lead today, which is the, really the focus of this webinar. Uh, but really, we are essentially pushing for countries to have a more holistic approach to children's environmental health, as we're calling it. In that we are saying, let's 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 look at what the major risks are, what are the major drivers that are impacting children's health, and how do we prioritize around that? So let's go to the next slide, please. This is lead. We don't really like lead. You see, it all goes back to a time when we thought we could be friends with lead. In fact, lead was even popular, invited into a whole range of everyday items like paint and gasoline. But over time, lead grew out of control and revealed a dark secret. It just can't stop poisoning people. So today, we've had enough. It's time to put lead to bed. That's because lead is causing a massive global health crisis, one that isn't getting enough attention. Let's take a look. Lead is a highly toxic metal and has particularly harmful effects on children. Young children absorb about four to five times as much lead as adults, and it affects almost every organ in a child's body. Even limited exposure to lead can cause damage that's devastating and permanent. So it's not surprising that we don't want lead around here anymore. What is surprising though, is the scale of the problems that it's caused. One in three children worldwide is now affected. That's around 800 million children across the globe at risk of lead poisoning. It's not all lead's fault though. You see, lead's usually perfectly okay being left alone in the Earth's crust. Lead still has some valuable uses in things like batteries and electronics. And if handled with care and recycled properly, it can even be possible to live alongside lead. But once lead is released into the environment, usually through people handling it the wrong way, it just can't help getting into everything it touches. Into the soil beneath us, through improper battery recycling, disposal of unwanted electronics, and other industrial processes. And from the dust released by peeling or chipping lead paints. Into the water we drink, for example, from old pipes that contain lead. Into the air we breathe, from unregulated smelting of lead acid batteries and burning of e-waste and even into some of the food and household goods that we consume. From contaminated spices to glazed ceramics, cosmetics, and painted toys. Once it's in the environment, lead lurks quietly, and its effects are insidious. Its symptoms difficult to spot. 
Sometimes there are no warning signs at all until it's too late. The effects on the developing brains of young children are particularly severe. For pregnant women, lead exposure can harm their unborn child and raise the risk of a range of complications, including miscarriage, stillbirth, premature birth, and low birth weight. There's no cure for lead poisoning. The damage it causes cannot be reversed. The only solution is prevention. We need to keep lead safely away from children. We need to put lead to bed. The good news is, that it's possible to eliminate the danger of lead once and for all. But this needs support from governments to ensure lead is eliminated from certain consumer products, such as paints, toys, ceramics, spices, and cosmetics, that it's used and recycled safely, and that contaminated sites are cleaned up. It needs support from industry to ensure responsible manufacturing and recycling so that lead is not leaked into the environment. And it needs support from communities to be aware and look out for lead to safely dispose of batteries and unwanted electronics, to keep children away from industrial and recycling sites, and to seek testing and care if a child may have been exposed to lead. By working together, we can eliminate the dangers of lead exposure to children. We can put lead to bed and ensure lifelong health and a bright future for every child. So that that is really I thought that was that would be the quickest way to summarize the topic itself uh, 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 that we are talking about and what that means for children. Um, if we can move to the next slide, please, Arshana. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, so yeah, as we saw, uh, that the, the statistic, the global estimate is one in three children poisoned by lead. Um, and we will we will seen, uh, soon soon see the reliability of that uh, and discuss it. Uh, uh, the issue is, is was well explained in the video, but essentially there is no safe level of expo exposure uh, to 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 lead, and children that are the youngest are are, are most at risk, uh, and that includes children in utero. Uh, and even the smallest level of exposure, exposure can impact, uh, 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 can result in brain damage, uh, as we call it, irreparable brain damage for children. Um, and, uh, and we have plenty of scientific evidence, particularly in high income countries, about the impact it causes. Um, uh, sorry, high income countries, uh, as well as actually uh, middle income countries, where we have also the, the, uh, the, the, the issue about academic achievement and its connection with with lead poisoning, um, uh, and then you have, of course, all of the other behavioral issues, uh, uh, violence later in life uh, uh, that can that uh, that has also been associated with the issue of lead poisoning. Let's move to the next slide, please. Right. So this is the levels of poisoning, if you like, under five micrograms per deciliter to under 10, under more than 30, more than 50, and, and the results you see, but it's essentially that irreparable brain damage that, that I was talking about and all that, uh, and as it plays out and the seriousness of it across, across the different uh, uh, levels of poisoning. Um, and of course, you have some other health effects because it impacts other systems. Uh, as well, uh, 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 cardiovascular, uh, re reproductive, and so on. So let's move to the next slide, please. So this is the real issue that we have. Uh, you have this map that shows you the one in three children uh, poisoned, and it shows you the countries where most of the estimates that are available from IHME globally in terms of poisoning uh, of children are available. And based on which we released the toxic truth reports and three years ago, um, that shows uh, the levels of uh, of poisoning. Uh, if you would click once, please, is the is the case of Georgia, and that's why Georgia, is, who's done fantastic work in this area, is here as well today in this webinar. Uh, and what we found, uh, if you could go back for a second, please, uh, uh, what we found in the case of Georgia that when we did the household survey mix in Georgia, we found that the levels were six uh, times higher than 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 global estimates uh, and that was 41 percent of children uh, that were poisoned 
uh, by lead compared to 6%, which was the global estimate for Georgia. So that's the that's the power, of course, uh, of a household survey like MIX and the importance of data collection around this issue and the reality it can bring because uh, and the uh, reality that surfaces as a result because that really triggered national action, action in Georgia uh, and a strong, uh, a strong uh, steps towards the journey. Of course, we haven't solved the problem yet, but there has been significant progress towards that. Um, and we will hear the case of mix in Georgia. So let's go to the next slide. Last one uh, from my side, uh, essentially, to say that if you want to learn more about lead uh, uh, and the and uh, uh, the information and that communication assets and the technical information that is available, you have a lot on here. Some of the links to that we will share this for interest for for beyond beyond the issue of data collection. But it's the approaches to blood level testing, which is the main guidance around the issue of data. Uh, my colleague Desiree, who's been leading a lot of this work, is going to talk more uh, in the next phase of this presentation. Sorry to take a little bit longer and sorry for the hiccups, uh, but but uh, great to great to discuss this issue uh, with you all. So back to you. Uh, Attila, is it, or we go straight to Desiree? Thank, thank you very much, Abit, and let's uh, let's hear Desiree's presentation. We will take the uh, the questions uh, at the very end. Please include your uh, put put your questions in the chat box, colleagues, while we uh, bring up Desiree's presentation. Thank you so much, yes. um, Attila, and thank you everyone for um, participating in this webinar, a clear signal of your interest on the topic, and thanks to the APM for um, organizing. So why do we do blood lead level testing? Um, according to WHO, the most common reasons for measuring the blood lead concentration are as follows. For health screening or surveillance program to identify lead exposed children, so this is the, um, the routine monitoring that we do um, to identify um, lead exposed children in a certain population. For exposure and risk assessment, such as a prevalence study of lead exposure related to specific sources, such as um, if you suspect a child that has been exposed to um, lead acid battery recycling or e-waste um, recycling, a uh, child that's been exposed to lead in paint, in um, wall, or in, in toys, or even drinking um, water from lead-contaminated pipes. Um, this is what we call also a sort of periodic monitoring, um, so exposure and risk assessment. And this could be done, and this is uh, could be done through our mix, through our uh, DHS surveys. Um, BLL is also being done to determine the need for the active management of lead exposure. So if you suspect, if you're a clinician and you suspect a child with really uh, lead poisoning, um, you need to have the level of the lead in the blood to be able to determine if you need to do chelation therapy. Um, and also to determine the effectiveness of risk mitigation measures. That means um, if there is, uh, for example, a um, uh, lead remediation, uh, soil remediation in the area, you may want to do the effectiveness of risk mitigation by doing a BLL testing. And of course, for occupational monitoring, when you have a population that's working in um, uh, lead acid battery recycling, for example. So blood lead level testing is part of screening or the secondary prevention, as we say in public health, of lead poisoning. So um, Initially, there must be um, a team to be able to assess the risk of lead exposure using criteria for selection of population to be screened. The team must be able to assess a sampling strategy or design. The team must be able to assess the screening capacity in terms of laboratory, in terms of uh, personal capacity. Decide on the appropriate screening methodology evaluate BLL results and quality of data. So the team must be able to, to really have an analysis of the data. And with the data, the team must be able to make recommendations to local policymakers on the interventions. As we know, lead is not only with the health sector, but it's also a multi-sectoral effort in involving the environment, the industry, and even the finance ministries. And if 
um, the team will be able should be able to refer high BLLs to hospitals for management. So the WHO has issued um, the 2021 clinical guidelines on um, uh, management of lead poisoning, and so um, they would the hospitals, the healthcare facility will be able to manage the child depending on the level of blood lead. Now, the US Center for Disease Control recommends um, the focus or the priority should be on children between ages 12 and 36 months. So one to two year old children because BLLs tend to be highest in the group and more of these children um, have 10 micrograms per DL of uh, blood lead. So what is this number? Um, so the WHO makes use of the five micrograms per DL. However, the US CDC has lowered its reference value to 3.5 micrograms per DL. And how did they arrive at this number? So they got this from the NHANES, the National Health and Nutrition Study that they do um, every four years. And they did a two cycle study and they found that um, blood lead levels in the US among US children has actually reduced. So this number is based on a national uh, representative population of children between five to five, one to five years of age. And they found out that 97.5% of children um, in the US were below that number. That's, this is for the two cycles of um, uh, 2016 to 17, 17 to 18. So um, they arrive at the, the advisory committee arrive at the 3.5 micrograms per DL. It does not, however, indicate lead poisoning or toxicity. It's just a reference point. And it's not indicative of what the clinical laboratory can tell you if you're a clinician about the individual child in your practice. So you really need to do, um, still do a blood lead level testing. Now, um, the American Academy of Pediatrics has recommended um, lead screening if a child is until six years old, at least four times. So you have um, a child at six months, a child at 12 to 18 months, a child at two to three years, and a child at four to six years. So this is ideal in a developed country uh, setting like the US. So um, moving on to the type of collection, storage, and laboratory um, analytical method. Um, so basically, there are two types the capillary collection and the venous uh, blood collection. So when you collect the capillary blood, it can go either to a capillary tube or it can go to a filter paper. If you do a venous blood collection, it can go to a capillary tube, to a filter paper or a vial. Now look at the analytical method. Um, the capillary um, method, the finger prick or a heel prick in a baby. Um, it can be done in a portable anodic stripping voltammetry. And in the US, there's only one brand and it's the only one manufacturer. It's also available in other countries. It's called the Lead Care 2. It's portable. It's, um, it could be done in a non-laboratory setting. However, uh, you have a high risk of contamination and basically um, we from uh, UNICEF Health do not recommend because of, aside from the contamination, there have been issues about um, reliability, accuracy, and precision of the results. So um, either a capillary um, blood can go to a filter paper, a venous blood can go to a vial, and um, ideally it should go to a laboratory for the analysis, so analytical laboratory, and the methods are the following. The flame atomic absorption spectrophotometry, the electrothermal atomic absorption spectrometry, or the inductively coupled plasma mass spectrometry, which is um, ICPMS. We will um, look at the differences of these three types of analytical methods later. Okay, so um, whole blood. So lead concentration in whole blood is the primary biomarker used to monitor exposure to lead. Why? Because um, you see the lead in blood is always in contact uh, with the tissues of the body. And it's been found that it is in equilibrium um, with, the, uh, with the tissues in the body. That's why we measure the lead concentration in whole blood. Now you have two types of blood lead testing, the venous and the capillary, as I mentioned. 
And the venous, you have to collect at least 5 to 10 ml of whole blood. In the capillary blood sampling, a finger or heel prick for babies. You can have the analysis done by a portable blood ana analyzer, as mentioned, or the lead care 2. You can have capillary um, using uh, dried blood sampling by using a simple filter paper or the volumetric absorptive microsampling or the uh, BAMS. We have now new technologies available, the TASO, the HEMASPAT, and the microvet. Um, this could be done at home, um, but you have to mail back the sample to the laboratory. However, um, the HEMASPAT, for example, is still in the um, research uh, stage, meaning it's being used for research and the microvet is um, also very high uh, technology that may need also um, professional health care professional supervision. So in all of this, um, in setting up a system for sample collection and transfer to the lab, you must meet certain requirements. And these are um, a clean sanitized location, clean and sterilized equipment, and a thoroughly clean puncture site. And so this is really to avoid the environmental contamination. As we know, lead is ubiquitous and it can really contaminate any object um, in the environment. So um, I listed here the advantages and disadvantages of um, the venous blood collection and the capillary. And under capillary, we have, um, I listed here the analysis, which is using the portable analyzer. Um, also, you can do dried blood spot using filter paper. You can have um, the volumetric absorptive microsampling, which is a modified DBS. And we have here the, the new technology, TASO, HEMASPAT, and MicroVet. Um, I will go into detail. Let's delve into this one by one as we move along. OK, number one, venous blood sampling. What's the advantage? This allows for more accurate quantification of body burden. And um, analyzing venous blood for lead is preferred for confirmation of exposure, diagnosis, and decisions in the medical management of lead poisoning and the prognosis. Now, what is the disadvantage? Um, this is a more invasive technique, of course, because you need to collect blood um, 5 to 10 ml. It requires a health professional or trained phlebotomist. Um, may not be suited for newborns and premature babies because of the um, invasive nature. And it could be stressful then. Um, it needs an anticoagulant, refrigeration, and freezing. And um, some analytes may, be, um, may have a lower stability. So analytes, um, that means could be lead, could be um, other heavy metals, mercury, arsenic, cadmium, or other analytes that uh, could be examined with the venous blood. So um, under capillary, we have the CDC guidelines in, in capillary or point of care. So using the uh, lead care too. So you, uh, one must wear personal protective equipment. Um, this designate a clean work area. Um, there must be a procedure for clean materials and techniques, a protocol for specimen co contamination, and ensure that there are no air gaps in capillary collection. Um, such that we don't have clotting in between. Okay, so um, if um, you collect a capillary blood sample and you use this portable ASV or the manufacturer name of Lead Care 2, um, it has the advantage of very simple to use and does not require trained lab personnel. Relatively easy, involves a prick, minimal pain, minimally invasive. However, um, the greatest risk is contamination that gives false positives. It is, um, it's a portable one, so and it's like off the laboratory. It is really less sensitive than lab methods. That's why you have um, issues of accuracy and precision. Um, the WHO recommends that it should only be for screening. Um, if you find, for, for example, a child with a blood lead level of five micrograms per DL, it has to be venous blood needs to be withdrawn and uh, has to be drawn and has to be sent to the laboratory. So really, um, instead of, you know, um, using the, the, the 
blood care too, it may, it's ideal really to send a sample, whether capillary or venous, to the laboratory so that you, you don't have to go through a process where uh, if you find a high um, BLL above uh, the reference point of five micrograms per DL, you would um, still need the laboratory. I have here the approx approximate cost as provided by the manufacturer. It's relatively cheap. Um, however, questions again of um, reliability, accuracy, and precision. And you can have the test kits um, according to the uh, manufacturer. It could be stored for one year at room temperature, and it could last for five years, the analyzer. And they always have a product team to, to repair in case of damage. Now, moving on to capillary using the dried blood sampling, you really have uh, the advantage of only a few drops of blood that are obtained from a finger or heel prick. So you can have a single use lancet. Um, of course, you can have a lower cost of a filter card and, and, and the lancet itself. So blood drops are collected on a filter paper and allowed to dry at room temperature. So you really need to um, dry the filter card. Um, the, the blood needs to be dried. Now, the advantage of um, you know, ease of collection and you avoid problems of clotting after the collection. It can be stored for prolonged periods of time. So you really have the um, convenience also of um, uh, prolonged uh, storage. Disadvantage, um, hematocrit level. So um, that, this, that means the percentage of blood cells in um, whole blood can affect the spread of blood and therefore the spot size. We know, of course, that whole blood has the plasma, it has the blood cells. So um, if you have very high levels of blood cells in the whole blood, it can affect the spreading of the blood. Um, you can have over or under filling of the spots affecting the analysis, and some of the analytes like uh, lead may not spread evenly on the card, and you can have environmental contamination. So this has been, um, we know that the DBS uh, technology has been used in a lot of our uh, mix and um, basically it's, it's a convenient uh, method, especially when we have it in, when we use uh, DBS in, uh, in our LMICs. Now the VAMS, as mentioned, is a derivative of the dried blood spot. So it's still a DBS technique, and, but the difference is that you have this poly, Meric absorptive tips of 10, 20, or 30 micro um, liter for sampling. So you can use this for any um, biological fluid like blood, saliva, and urine. The advantage is you can collect accurate and reproducible quantities of biological fluids because you can, you can use the whole tip for the analysis. Um, so you don't have the hematocrit effect or an even spreading of the analytes. It can be uh, stored and shipped at room temperature. It provides high stability, um, especially for lead. It is easy to collect. You don't need a trained medical staff. It will enable at-home sampling, and you can have um, automation of analytical processes in the lab, and you can have uh, same dimension as the pipette tips. Uh, disadvantage is a higher cost than filter paper DBS, and later on, we will hear more from Georgia since they plan to use this technology in their surveillance system. Um, TASO, as mentioned, is a new technology um, recommended by the US CDC because it's um, more convenient here in the US. Um, this, this kit is just being mailed to the, um, to the patient if uh, the patient wants to do uh, his own collection. So you can have um, the kit and, the, um, and then put in the arm to collect the blood and it will just be mailed back. So you have indeed a convenient collection by the patient. It enables at-home sampling. However, um, comparing it to the uh, filter paper DBS, and um, it, it could have a higher cost. OK, so let's just try to compare the different analytical methods, the FAAS, the electrothermal AAS, and the ICPMS. So, um, you know, the choice of the analytical method will really depend on the objective. So, and also it will depend on the sample size of the, um, uh, the data to be collected. It will also depend on the 
the cost um, that will be um, entailed as well as also the availability of um, personnel uh, both in the collection and also in the analysis in the laboratory. So if you have FAAS, um, it has a short analysis time. It's relatively easy to use. Um, you can have low capital and running costs. However, you would need a very large sample size and you can have, um, you know, the detection limit is a bit high. So anything lower than that um, cannot be detected. And it cannot be left unattended because it's, it makes use of a flammable gas. The, um, these are just approximate costs based on research, um, comparing the cost of the three uh, types of analytical methods. In the electrothermal AAS, um, relatively you can have a low detection limit and it can analyze small samples. Um, it may be left un unattended because um, there is no gas that's being used and because it's electric, and so no need for sample preparation. Disadvantage, you can have a limited analytical working range and require some lab expertise and longer analysis time, so slow sample throughput. Um, we are not recommending, but uh, most of the laboratories act for, for blood lead testing and analysis use the ICPMS. Why? Because it has a very low limit of detection. It can analyze small samples, so even a 50 to 100 um, microliter can be uh, uh, sample can be tested. Um, you can have um, very fast analysis time, less than one minute, um, wide analytical working range, and it can have a multi-element capability. So for example, if you want to test not only for lead, but for other um, heavy metals like lead, mercury, cadmium, you can, you can really um, use also ICPMS to analyze. And then there is also potential to perform isotopic ratio analysis with some forms of ICPMS. Um, and isotopic ratio analysis means it could help you identify the source of the lead. So if you're really interested to know what's the source of the lead in the environment, um, you can do, um, you can use the ICPMS to, to have to identify the source using the isotopic ratio analysis. Disadvantage, it has a high purchase and running cost. It requires a highly skilled laboratory staff and you have an analysis of the large number of samples that is actually um, is, is cheaper than the ETAS. Now, um, we recommend that the laboratory should be um, accredited so there is a, a so-called ILAC, it's called International Laboratory Accreditation Cooperation, where the laboratories go through a system of accreditation using the ISO standards. And um, here um, we have identified the laboratories, at least for the four countries that are um, initially doing uh, lead reduction activities, Indonesia, Bangladesh, Ghana, and Georgia. Um, I, laboratories that could be where the lab samples can, lead samples can be sent to be tested um, because they have met the ILAC um, standards. And um, so what to do if there is no ILAC accredited laboratory in the country, um, there could also be a regional um, uh, consortium or there could also be um, the supply division can work with a program group to be able to um, have some LTAs for um, per sample basis. Um, we can find a way, but the recommendation really is if you do BLL um, in the country is to send the sample to an accredited ILAC laboratory. So very important are the ethical considerations. So when undertaking any kind of surveillance or exposure assessment studies, so whether you do it for um, routine or periodic monitoring, it is important to adhere to national, international ethical principles and the national legal framework. There should be a national ethical committee um, that approves the, um, the design, um, the study itself. There must be a legitimate purpose of the study. Why are you doing BLL? Um, and um, you must also identify the age group and have a written informed consent obtained from the study subjects with the sufficient information provided in the form. 
Um, and then when the results are in, there should be a clear explanation. There must be a risk communication if the BL, if the lead level is so high that um, there is potential for further evaluation or follow up. That means um, there is the health system must be prepared that uh, that you have healthcare facility in place that will be able to um, have the uh, to manage uh, child poison with lead. In conclusion, um, we know that whole blood is the primary biomarker of lead exposure. And it's important really to identify lead exposed children to inform policymakers to draft relevant policies and legislation. And of course, to do action, multi sectoral action to prevent and treat um, lead poisoning. So we said that there are two basically methods um, venous and capillary and for both methods, there should be extra care to avoid contamination. And our country offices will be able to advise the ministries of health on the BLL testing given the country context and also factoring in ethical considerations. Additionally, you know, the health sector can work with the environment sector, with the industry sector, um, and then be able to manage children with high BLLs at, at the same time also address sources of lead in the environment. And in doing so, um, we hope to have uh, 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 our children reaching their full potential. So I invite you to have a look at our SharePoint that has um, on healthy environments for healthy children. And um, we have our spotlight issues here, um, including lead poisoning and air pollution. And that um, if you want to read further, we have references also available in this presentation. So um, thank you so much, and let's promote healthy environments for healthy children. Thank you very much, Desiree. Uh, let's uh, immediately go to the presentation from our Georgia country office colleagues. OK. So hello, everyone, and thank you for giving UNICEF Georgia country office the opportunity of sharing our experience on lead exposure problem in the country. So we have a, a lot to cover today, so we really should begin. But before, let me allow to express our special appreciation to mix HQ and regional teams, to PCP team, especially to our dear colleagues Abit and Desiree, to our former representative Laila Omergad, who is inspired us for MIX, and also to UNICEF Georgia's former staff member, Andrea Nadiradze, who joined us today from China office. I can't thank him enough for supporting lead prioritization in MIX back in 2018, when we really hardly believed in this possibility. And finally, our big thank goes to our current management, to Gassan and Amy for being with us all the time. So moving to the topic of today's meeting, how we started. Before MIX, uh, there was no proper evidence on lead exposure of Georgia's children, but at the same time, numerous small scale studies and anecdotal evidence was indicated on lead problem among Georgia's children and really calling for a thorough study evaluation of this issue. So we carried out mix, but most importantly, we managed also to integrate the lead module within mix. The respective data made it possible for the government to take informed decision and as a follow up to start introduction of evidence based interventions. So I will stop here and invite my colleague George for mix details. Georgi, over to you. Thank you, Taco. Thank, uh, hello, colleagues, and I would like to thank all of the persons that Taco mentioned already. I will not repeat this. Hello, Andrea. So how it started? Let me, uh, on one hand, I will try to be as much as brief to fit into the time limit. On the other hand, I want to give as much as possible the details that how we incorporated the lead testing module into mix in 2018. So the first question that appeared during this planning process was, um, should we collect venous or capillary blood? And in 2018, 
we had actually limited options for blood collection. In Georgia at that time, we, were, we have a few magnet anal analyzers that were actually recalled by the producers due to the fact that there was the underestimation by it. We were told by the colleagues from NCDC, USCDC, and the Italian Institute of Health that we needed to collect more blood. There is just one draw. So which, mean, which means that if we take it from finger, so capillary blood, we would need more manipulations. We would to press like finger of a child to, to get more blood which in this case, the child would be suffering. And uh, so if we do it very softly, then it might take a long time. And in both cases, at least the child has a pain, and on the other hand, mother or caretaker most probably will, reduce, will refuse. So that was, the, that was the actual risk. Again, these organizations also recommended us to apply for the windows blood, testing with ICPMS as a gold standard. So according to above mentioned, we decided to collect venous blood. Nowadays, as Desiree already showed in uh, her presentation, the situation has changed. Uh, due to the new methods and analyzers, uh, we, can, we can choose the capillary blood as well. Nina will incorporate a few slides on this in her presentation um, later on. So the second question that we, we faced was the reference group. Which reference group should we take? Again, these organizations, I, I mostly I mean the NCDC, USCDC, and the Italian Institute of Health recommended us why one to five years old children as a gold standard. But since collection of women's blood from one year old children would be very difficult, we decided to set the lower bound of age at two. At that time, we just set the upper bound of age at nine years, and I will incorporate, I will tell about this later in my slide. Next slide, please. Uh, okay, and then we faced a major problem. What major problem is the risk? The risk, possible risks related to inclusion of blood testing in MIG. So the risk was very obvious. We had no experience in, in, in this exercise, meaning that the lab testing has never been done in, um, in uh, including, the lab testing has never been including in mix. Uh, we had no standard module on mix. As a result of this, inclusion of lab module in mix could cause a sharp decrease, not only uh, in response rate uh, for blood testing, but also for the whole survey. And that was the main, main risk uh, for us. Next slide, please. Since the risk was due to the fact that we had no experience, then simply we needed to gain experience. Together with headquarters and the regional office colleagues, we planned to pilot the whole field work, meaning that to pilot whole choreography of the field work, every single step, and to see whether it is really risky or not. So it means that we collected uh, data with all the questionnaires, every single questionnaire. Then we we tested every step of lead testing module from taking blood from two to nine years old children to deliver the samples to the municipal centers. It means that we tested whole cold chain from taking the blood, taking the blood from children to, to send to the uh, CDC centers, which were located in every single municipality in Georgia. Actually, the exercise showed that we, there, I mean, the response rate was higher, unexpectedly higher. We expected a bit lower, and we saw that it was higher. Also, the pilot showed that the lead component also didn't negatively affect the core mix modules. Hence, the decision was made to add it to the standard mix. Next slide, please. Communication campaign. Yeah. Another risk, risk prevention was a comprehensive communication campaign, but this was not done specific. This was not done specifically for mix, for, for for blood testing. We had planned the communication campaign for mix, while the blood testing just you know benefited from this as well. In addition to this, I I should mention that as a result of UNICEF's 
I mean, uh, here here we have the list of campaign uh, step by step that uh, UNICEF country office did. This was the with the government. We had the press conference in four cities. Then we had the animation and video clips were prepared. Information brochures were printed in Georgian and two other languages, ethnic minority languages. Actually, we had teams in uh, in two ethnic minority languages, uh, and we had interviews in these languages as well. Plus, the mixed teams were provided with branded bags, caps, and vests, and community and time hall meetings as well as face-to-face -face campaigns were organized. But besides this, in addition to this, as a as a result of UNICEF's advocacy, the lead issue appeared high on government's agenda. Actually, the ombudsman in her annual address to the parliament noted the lead exposure is the biggest problem. Realization of rights of life, health and development. In addition, the health minister of Georgia at that time before field work started actually addressed to the parliament that and said that the government will act in accordance with the UNICEF led survey results. That was recognition and we uh, we use this, this opportunity as well. Next slide, please. So now I'm going back to the defining reference age group. So at this stage, we have already had some information. So we considered the following information. Pilot results that showed higher response rate for lead module than we expected. We assessed possible uh, effects of the overarching campaign. Plus, at the same time, we already knew that uh, Italian Institute of Health offered us 1,500 blood samples free of charge. Mm. And finally, at that time, we already had the sampling done. So we knew that this is the number of households to be interviewed. And since we, we did, before sampling, since we did listening uh, exercise as well, we knew how many children at each age were uh, living in that household. So just to summarize, we assessed response rate, we added some percentages due to the possible effects of communication campaign, and has calculated upper bound of children age, which actually decreased from nine to seven years old. So finally, finally the reference age group, we defined from two to seven to fit this 1,500 offered by the Italian Institute uh, of Health as well. The mixed questionnaire. So here in my slide, you see the questionnaires that we have used uh, during mix, the standard questionnaires, household questionnaire, individual questionnaires for women, men, children's questionnaire under five, five to 17, anthropometry water. And in addition to these questionnaires, we also used uh, lead testing questionnaire. Next, please. Uh, let's talk about a bit more about uh, lead testing questionnaire. So before data collection started on this module, I mean, uh, an informed consent was obtained for mothers or caretakers. Signing a special form, consent form, and this consent form contained some information. For example, data confidentiality, that data will not be shared to any of third party. Purpose of the study, testing process. We said we provided information that testing process will be done by special um, uh, medical personnel, a phlebotomist. Uh, expected risks, benefits to participate in the survey and sharing the results. Last two, I guess it was, was the most important as, as we shared the information that at that time in Georgia, it cost 45 US dollar to test uh, against blood. So we said to the to the care, care the mothers and caretakers that so it costs 45 US dollar. Your child, we will test your child uh, with um, in one of the best laboratory of Europe with uh, you know ICPMS, and then uh, we will share this information to you. So you will have free test with uh, with the results. And you know, uh, this also positively, these two, at least these two positively affected, affected response rate. In addition, we provided small gifts to the children. 
Uh, that's where either Play-Doh or big chalks for outdoor use. Next, please. So sampling, I mean, um, uh, for, the, for the whole mix, we used sampling frame. As a sampling frame, we used 2014 population census. Uh, sample size was uh, a bit more than 14,000 households. Sampling approach was a uh, two-stage stratified cluster sampling, where the first stage, we sampled 706 uh, enumeration area, and in each enumeration area, we sampled 20 households. So overall, it was more than a bit more than 14,000 households sampled. For lab testing, the sampling frame was two to seven years old children from those 14,000 households. Sampling approach was one child was randomly selected from each interviewed household. You know, we were, I mean, uh, we knew that uh, Italian Institute will uh, test 1,500 uh, tests, right? So we actually wanted to have different households. So that's why we did selection. So we selected one child per household. We strongly believe that um, if there is more than one child, child in, in the same household, he or she would have mostly the same le elevated lead level if, if it existed. And uh, finally, so according to this, uh, our approaches and such, finally we got 60% from uh, response rate for all the children, two to seven years old, which was 1,578. So our approach of, you know, this uh, assessing response rates and you know, assessing campaign, assessing things actually worked. We got the response a bit more 1,500. So we had no problem with this. Mixed team composition. Actually, uh, we had 13 group and 19 field personnel. Um, uh, staff is, I mean, the usual staff, supervisor, four interviewers, measurer, and additionally, we hired one phlebotomist who did uh, uh, blood uh, uh, collection. So in this slide, we we'll see responsibilities of team members. Interviewers were responsible for administering the lead questionnaire, obtaining of consent, etc. Phlebotomists were responsible for blood extraction, while measurers, these were also the important people because measurers were responsible for assisting phlebotomists whenever possible in holding a child's head or, you know, uh, child for a blood collection, during the blood collection, while supervisors did the uh, standard stuff. Next, please. So I will not bother you with uh, reading this slide. Here we have materials used for flat uh, sampling. In case of need, you can just you know, open. In this slide, uh, yeah, next please. In this slide, you will you will see that uh, you know the sabatomis uh, and the child is painting actually I'm painting uh, using the, the gifted charts. And um, here are the uh, equipment that we, we actually use during the during data collection. Next, please. Okay, this slide is important. This is this shows the whole pole chain. So we started at 1.5 ml of blood was collected. Okay, then the tube was placed in the fridge, which gave. Uh, uh, which stored below plus or Celsius. The blood samples were transported to the storage lab in a portable fridges that can keep the samples below plus four Celsius. To achieve such temperature, the portable fridges were filled with ice cubes. Samples were shipped to the NCDC storage unit as soon as possible, at least every day. I mean, for sure that daily it was done, and at the storage unit, samples were maintained at minus 20 Celsius until the, it was sent to Italian laboratory. Uh, and, uh, well, results. Finally, for the first time in mixed history, UNICEF Georgia, together with the mixed global and regional team, designed and in coordination with the National Statistics Office of Georgia and the NCDC, 
integrated nationally representative children-led testing module in me. Here are the main results, only main results. I didn't, uh, I don't want to bother you with the detailed results, etc. I just showed the uh, very, very main results. 41% of children aged two to seven years old have elevated lead level in blood more than five micrograms per deciliter, while 60% of children had more than 10 micrograms per deciliter. Next, please. Uh, yeah, challenges. So every survey, in every survey we face some challenges, but which, uh, there were several challenges that we faced during the planning and field work processes. Here are some. So different, difficult to collect venous blood, especially from young children, two years old or three years old, etc. Difficult to convince a parent and child. Need an additional staff with special skills, in addition to the standard mixed staff. I mean, a phlebotomist. Complicated logistics was an issue as well. I already, uh, you already, you saw it in my uh, one of my slides that it was called the cold chain and many steps, you know, included there. Disinformation and means misconceptions. You know, I recall that one of the good examples of this were that there were cases when village doctors and pediatricians recommended families not to participate in the lead survey. And there was a head of NCDC made an official statement on this issue, etc. So there can be an information as well. And the final the, uh, uh, false expectations. You know, there were a number of cases where households participated in MIGS, wanted to participate in lead testing as well, while has not been selected for this. For, this. for example, the child was more than seven years old or, or less than two years old, or there were few children at same household and other children, parents of other children also wanted to test the uh, other children as well, and so forth. Uh, next, please. Lessons learned. So we, from my presentation, um, I guess I, I, I'm trying to explain that uh, communication extremely important. This is obvious, everyone knows. Mobil mobilizing various stakeholders in the advocacy action and response is also important. Um, maybe from my presentation, it's more obvious that the power of proper planning, that was, that was really very important. As described above, we had a very detailed plan, including piloting, piloting every single stage, which finally gave its results. So we piloted everything and actually we, we finally got the result. And the comprehensive monitoring. There was a standard daily monitoring. Packing from field check tables, ending with, you know, monitoring in the field. For example, out of three months, I was one and a half months I was in the field, and my colleagues from UNICEF, from NCDC, and the National Statistics Office. So comprehensive monitoring is crucial in this, uh, this type of uh, service. And my final slide is uh, advantages of inclusion of lead testing in mix. So, the first question, uh, the first, the relatively low cost. So there is no extra. May, I might answer some of uh, some question about costing. This slide uh, might answer some questions on costing as well. So no extra cost for communication campaign. You know, it just benefited from the communication campaign. No transportation cost, as you know, there was a, a minivan and we just added one person, one phlebotomist. Supervision and, and monitoring, but again, no extra cost. No extra cost for a person who helped lobotomist. As, as I mentioned, that we assigned a measurer who has time actually to help lobotomist, and such. The main benefit, now let's go to the main, main, main benefit of, this, of being, uh, adding VLL uh, in, in the mix, was possibility to analyze Mm, let testing uh, results with other data from mix and mix has which of data so we have crop tabulate in many in many ways with many ways and finally added more interest to mix so adding blood testing in mix actually popularized mix even more 
as many stakeholders and people said that lab testing was part of me. So lab testing in Georgia was associated with me. In addition, some, I must say that some donors actually gave more money due to inclusion of lab testing in it. So that was a brief uh, description uh, of history. I mean, the story how we incorporated this uh, module in Mix. Thank you for your attention, and uh, Nino will continue what has happened afterwards. Hello, everyone, and thank you, Georgi, for going through the details of Georgia Mix. I will now briefly focus on further steps and the possibilities that the evidence generated through Mix gave us. And um, uh, well, let me start um, to say that uh, using the Mix data, generated data, we advocated for legal and policy changes in the country, uh, try to raise awareness of the public on the harm of lead and possible ways of prevention. And as Georgi mentioned, they attracted donor attention and resources to uh, follow up on the further activities. Uh, in response to the mixed uh, evidence, government uh, developed a multi-year interagency action plan and also developed a very um, concise disease detection and screening state program to address blood lead levels in children. Uh, and they first of all treated the kids that were detected as having high BLL through mix. Uh, later on, the program was expanded to include uh, children referred by pediatricians as having symptoms possibly related to lead exposure. Uh, new regulations were developed or introduced, for example, of safety of toys, paint and other, which really helped to uh, combat lead exposure. Uh, as for UNICEF, when we did mix, Georgi mentioned, we sent uh, our samples to it blood samples to Italy because there was no lab in the country, private or public, that could uh, do blood testing in Georgia. Therefore, UNICEF, as a next step, decided to give the country this possibility, and we helped uh, support it, um, the government, namely local CDC and CDC, and established them uh, chemical risk factor uh, laboratory there, which is equipped with uh, cutting edge equipment. Here you'll see most of them. Uh, there we are uh, four uh, XRF analyzers, which are very handy uh, portable uh, devices to test uh, lead or any other heavy metals in uh, various specimen. A good thing is that you can carry them and check uh, the sites on spot. You can go to households with them to, uh, to see if there are any, uh, if there is lead in the uh, human or other specimen. Uh, then we also uh, provided atomic absorption spectrometer, uh, which is also a powerful machine to detect almost all chemical elements, heavy metals in various specimens. And they, it can um, actually uh, check, detect and see the content of these uh, elements in various specimen. Uh, and last but not least, we pr uh, purchased the uh, ICPMS, um, mass spectrometer for the laboratory, which is a very sophisticated equipment that can uh, that is very sensitive and can detect very low levels of uh, lead or any other chemical elements. And what is more, uh, it can do uh, isotopic analysis uh, to see the isotopic ratios of lead or other chemical elements in various specimens. As Zira mentioned, this is most important for identifying sources of exposure. We also organized trainings for the lab staff um, and uh, support still continues on capacity building of the laboratory and in investigation of sources of exposure through leveraging donor uh, resources and technical expertise. Uh, and what is most important, we helped the country to design environmental health surveillance system with focus on lead initially uh, and consensus has been built to launch the stepwise the system 
system starting in 2023. Uh, main objective of the surveillance system actually is to monitor blood level, the levels uh, of children, five to seven year old children nationally and regionally uh, to measure S prevalence, so changes over time. And the secondary objective and the very important objective is to identify sources of lead exposure. Again, if we don't identify sources and remove them, there is no way to uh, eliminate lead exposure. And this is the overview of the uh, proposed uh, surveillance system, which has several stages, as you see, including testing, including uh, transportation of samples, epidemiological assessment, reporting. Um, and the novelty of the proposed system is microvolume blood sampling devices and method of uh, micro sampling, um, which is uh, a very new method validated quite recently. Uh, and um, the good thing about this method is you need, as Desiree mentioned, only small volumes of blood. It can be capillary blood. Uh, and as you have seen from Georgi's presentation, the logistics of venous blood was collecting venous blood was very complicated, although it was worth going through it at that time. But now the, the time has passed and we have new methods we could, we could apply. Uh, and uh, this method is less invasive, less stressful for children. Uh, samples uh, are just dried at room temperature, no sophisticated uh, logistics, and um, uh, it is much more convenient. Uh, here you can see a picture of uh, venous blood sampling versus microvams, microvolume sampling, and you, as you will see, microvolume sampling has less stages and this much simpler. Uh, and uh, our lead surveillance system will be linked to the immunization registry because the immunization registry has uh, biggest coverage, almost 100% coverage, uh, and it is electronic one. So also children uh, have to go to the clinics anyway for uh, mandatory immunization. So there is no need to pay extra visit. They can do blood tests together with vaccination. Uh, the this proposed new methodology allows only simple training for medical personnel uh, and the simple logistics, which in the end is more cost efficient. Uh, our surveillance system uh, will uh, look at the sources of exposure as well, where high BLL is detected, environmental samples will, environment and samples will be collected, uh, and uh, also some samples will be collected in the control groups as well to see the um, real picture. All data will be collected together on one portal electronically and analyzed on a regular basis, uh, and evidence will be used for efficient functioning of the samples surveillance system, but most importantly, for further policy interventions. Benefits of the surveillance system that we have proposed to the government are that it is it means that the surveillance system is primary health prevention measure, what is recommended by WHO and USCDC as well. Uh, it will generate regular evidence on the blood lead levels and changes over time. It will also identify sources of ex lead exposure, and it will be linked to other electronic registers, registers that will allow better data analysis and better uh, policy interventions as well. Uh, here is the link to our mix survey and uh, lead related um, information on our web. Unfortunately, our uh, lead surveillance uh, system document is not yet uploaded because we, see we are still waiting for some uh, official steps before we upload it. But uh, if somebody is interested, we can definitely share um, more details about it. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. We have taken more time than uh, planned, but I hope it was interesting and uh, thanks to all our colleagues who supported us through these uh, efforts. Thank you very much. Thank you very much Nino and colleagues. Um, we have only seven minutes before end. Um, we have a series of questions. Uh, I will just ask you to um, to um, to respond to a few questions with, within a minute, within two minutes, etc. We won't be able to cover all the questions. 
uh, as you saw, uh, colleagues, this is a very important uh, health challenge, uh, lead poisoning, uh, which needs to be taken seriously. Um, it um, so uh, th th we 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 went went through a webinar which which included a very important topic. Uh, just to clarify uh, for everyone, as you saw, uh, the mix in Georgia included blood lead testing, uh, which was very useful, uh, very good results, and I was very happy also to hear about the uh, the impact of the results and the use of it and the actions taken and the campaigns that followed data collection. That's what matters in the end, right? Uh, for the global mix program, uh, just to to indicate that blood lead testing at this point is not part of the standard uh, tools um, uh, for for mix seven, which is coming up. But as you saw in the Georgia case, in some countries uh, we can add uh, we can have add-ons uh, to the surveys at the country level. So that's what happened in the in the in the case of Georgia mix. So uh, I was looking at the questions. Some of them have been answered already in the chat box. There were several questions on comparing the Venus and the capital, capillary methods in terms of cost, in terms of uh, sensitivity, specificity. Uh, can I have one minute from, from Desiree to, to say something about uh, specificity and sensitivity and the cost of those two, two, two main methods? So the cost actually of um, capillary in terms of the collection is cheaper compared to the Venus. Um, However, um, what matters is now the laboratory analysis. So you can have different costs for the lab analysis. So um, we have some indicative costing here. Um, for ICPMS, it's $40 per test. FAAS is $10. And the uh, G, the gas, um, FAAS is $26. So you do have um, significant um, uh, comparison in terms of uh, pricing for the lab analysis, but in terms of the capillary collection, it's definitely cheaper um, because um, you only have to spend for the um, incision, the capillary collection tube, as well as, of course, the usual um, alcohol prep pads and also um, the uh, the, uh, the 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 lancet itself. But for the um, uh, the Venus, you can also, you need to spend for the tourniquet, for the butterfly needles, for the um, EDTA, the purple, um, the, the um, coagulant. So um, that's definitely um, more expensive than using capillary. Um, but as I said, capillary has um, different um, types. So you can also have the dried blood sampling or you can have the modified VAMS. Um, for the uh, DBS using filter paper is uh, cheaper compared to the VAMS, but we saw also the benefit of the VAMS, which, has, which is more accuracy in terms of the hematocrit and the spread of the blood in the filter paper. Over. Thank you, Desiree. Um, that's good. Uh, would it be fair to say that uh, one, uh, to, to recommend one over the other would be case specific? Um, Indeed, and it also depends on the population to be tested. So um, if, if there is really indeed, um, you know, in terms of consent, uh, using venous blood um, may be more challenging if you do the capillary testing. Yeah, so in other words, we have to look at the specific situation to decide uh, uh, for one method over the other. Exactly. A quick question to, to Georgi. Uh, there was a question about the response rate in mixed Georgia. Yeah. So uh, overall response rate was at the household level was 87%. And for women were 80%, for men 60%, under five children and five to 17 was around 90%. While uh, for blood testing, it was around 60% response rate. 60%. Thank, thank you very much, Georgi. A series of questions about ethical, ethics related uh, issues in, in the Georgia mix. Um, what were the challenges for getting informed consent? I think uh, uh, Georgi summarized them uh, to a large extent in his presentation. But there's, there's other questions about um, were parents notified of the results? Uh, what, were the what were the actions taken uh, for children with, with the high blood um, lead levels?
<laughs> Any colleague from the Georgia country office to answer this question? Yes, Maybe definitely. A couple of minutes. Uh, yeah, um, as we had in our presentation, a Georgian government with a UNICEF support and advocacy took immediate steps and the state program was developed to uh, tackle the problem. Uh, in the first year, killed ch children identified with high BLL uh, as a result of mix, we are uh, kind of uh, tested again and they were um, given a medical, free medical consultations. There we are given uh, if required certain uh, care, including uh, vitamins, uh, supplements that could help somehow um, prevent further exposure uh, or maybe uh, reduce uh, level of uh, lead a little bit. Uh, they were given recommendations. I mean, how um, families were given uh, recommendations on uh, hygiene and uh, uh, nutrition uh, that could also somehow help the children uh, and um, also children for in their families, other children and pregnant women also we are tested and given free medical consultations, recommendations and uh, treatment if required. Thank you very much, Nino. Um, Abid, Desiree, Georgi, Tako and Nino, thank you very much for this exciting uh, series of presentations. Thank you very much to all the participants for participating and, uh, and spending their time with us this morning, this evening, this afternoon, wherever you might you might have been. And I uh, uh, I would like to leave the floor to Archana to wrap up our webinar. Archana. Yes. Thank you, Attila, and thank you to our presenters today for the stimulating conversation and discussion. I'd just like to remind everybody that the next webinar will be taking place on February 22nd by Trevor Croft, who is the Chief of Data Quality at the DHS program. And the topic will be using pregnancy histories, the experience of the DHS program. So I hope you'll be able to join us for that. And uh, just a reminder, the presentations and recordings will be available on the SharePoint site shortly internally as well as the recording will be available on the MIX YouTube channel uh, for our external colleagues. So with that, thank you all very much and uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you everyone, goodbye. Thank you, bye. Thank you, bye.